Good morning, everyone. My name is Natrine Chuck, and I'm the pre-med programming coordinator for this year's conference. First of all, I would like to thank the AMC for sponsoring this event and making uh, and providing everyone access for th these videos online. Today, I have the honor to introduce our next keynote speaker, a continuous supporter of our conference, Vice Admiral Matthew Nathan. Class Admiral Nathan is the 37th Surgeon General of the Navy and the Chief of the Navy's Bureau of Medicine and Surgery. He's also the co-chairman of the Recovering Warrior Task Force at the Department of Defense. As the Surgeon General of the Navy, Class Admiral Nathan oversees more than 63,000 men and women who make up the Navy family medicine in protecting, promoting, and restoring the health of the sailors and the Marines, as well as their families, around the world that sum up to more than one million eligible beneficiaries. Class Admiral Nathan also served as the commander, Walter Reed National Military Medical Center and Navy Medicine, National Capital Area, where he is the Naval component commander to the largest military medical integration and construction project in the Department of Defense history. Dr. Nathan is board certified and holds fellow status in the American College of Physicians and the American College of Healthcare Executives. He also holds an appointment as a clinical professor of the medicine at the Uniformed Services University of Health Sciences. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Vice Admiral Nathan. Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to be back here again, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about what we do in the federal health care sector vis-a-vis -vis Navy medicine, military medicine. Um, I grew up in this area. I went to high school in Napa, California. Uh, so I have a, a great attachment to the Davis campus as well as the UC system. Uh, I'm currently uh, down working in San Francisco at Fleet Week where we're looking at how we're going to partner together in the event, when the event of a large earthquake or other natural disaster hits the coast, how are we going to respond? And how are we going to be there? How ready are we going to be as a community and as a partnership to provide care, probably expedient care from the sea when that happens? Because that's sort of my territory. That's where I live. Um, I want to empathize with many of you who are out here in the audience and who are online watching us today. I recognize this can be a challenging time in your lives. You're trying to juggle the anxiety of what you're going to do next and where, you, where you're going to do it. Um, application processes, whether you're interested in dentistry or allied health and physical therapy or optometry, uh, in whether you're medicine, uh, nursing, um, but the one thing that unites all of you is that you have an interest in health care and giving back. And that makes you special. Uh, you have an interest in giving yourselves to a service, to a ethos of making a difference in other people's lives. And at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. At the end of the day, you don't leave this world with how much you've taken you leave this world with how much you've given. And so that is the common denominator of all of you who are interested in this. And you can really make a difference. I think that um, life is what happens to you when you're making other plans. As I've said from this podium before, as I look out in the audience, um, fashions have changed somewhat and so have hairstyles, but when I was at your point in your careers, in your schooling, be it in college or in high school or pre-medical, pre-health desires, I had hair down past my shoulders. I had a beard. And the Navy was not in my future vision. That wasn't my DNA. But I uh, was fortunate enough to be accepted in a medical school, which itself was a feat because, as I've also said here before, to encourage those of you who were worried about your academic standing, worried about your curriculum vitae and how your trajectory is going to get into difficult application processes, be it veterinary, medical, dental schools, those kinds of things. Um, when I took the SATs and I took the English achievement test, 
I scored so low on the English achievement test that my father said I should apply to colleges as a non-English non speaking student. Um, that was the only way that was going to explain those low scores. So, but I was passionate about medicine. I was passionate about trying to get there and I eventually did it. And I came across the Navy as a, at the time, a means to an end, a way to avoid a large burden of loans going through medical school. So I signed up for the Health Profession Scholarship Program where I attended, when, which paid for my private medical school, paid for my housing, my lodging, and also gave me a very generous stipend every month so I could be comfortable and, and, and do some nice things while I was in school. Never intending to make it a career, but I found, because I didn't really know what it was all about, I found that our organization in military medicine had this tremendous diversity and portfolio of what you could do. And so as you may know, is what, what we sort of are renowned for is our support of our troops when they go into harm's way. And that's a big deal. That's one of our major competencies, is providing care to those who go in harm's way, be it on sea or on land. We've done so for the last many years in taking care of people who were significantly injured grievously injured on the battlefield. And we have moved the dial of survival. And even if that's not your DNA, even if you're thinking, well, you know, that's not my thing, combat casualty care, it certainly has now come to a theater near you. Because if you or I are driving back today on 80, and we end up getting into a heinous accident where we are in danger of losing our limbs, or we've suffered a puncturing chest wound, or we've ruptured our spleen, or we have a closed head injury, our lives will statistically be saved because of many of the techniques that we have learned and transferred now from combat casualty care. So just to put it in perspective, and this is sort of guess what I'm thinking, in the Civil War, when the weaponry of choice was the ball and musket, what was and you received a life-threatening wound where if you didn't get to a medical care station in the Civil War in time, you would die. How many people survived life-threatening wounds in the Civil War? About 60%. Now you move forward to, oh, say, um, 100 years from then uh, to the Vietnam War. And those who presented with life-threatening wounds survived about 75% of the time. And now you move forward to the current war and conflicts that are occurring in places like Afghanistan and Iraq. And if somebody uh, is exposed to a life-threatening wound now, or injuries, what's their percentage of survivability? It's 97%. So we now transfer that technology, that competency, into the way we care for people who suffer grievous wounds in our freeways or in our cities. So one of the things I'd also like to take you through is, and the theme has been touched on by a lot of people, and I call it skating to where the puck will be, um, is what's the next thing installed for medicine? What's in healthcare? Where will you end up practicing? Where will you end up participating, no matter what your role is? What will change about the way you participate and get your care compared to when we first started? So if I asked you all to tell me what you think the first great game changer was in healthcare in the world, the one thing that happened that all of a sudden people stopped dying in droves and started living in droves, what would you guess? What changed the game of medicine? The first great changer. Understanding infectious disease. Antibiotics, vaccinations. All of a sudden, walking in with, with, with a pneumococcal pneumonia was no longer a death sentence. Understanding uh, smallpox, polio, um, vaccination, where those were death sentences because we now knew to wash our hands before we touched a patient, because we now understood vaccination because we understood how to prevent rabies, because we understood how to eradicate polio and smallpox. 
And of course, in today's modern 21st century, we would never be threatened by another virus again, right? And the answer, of course, is we're, we're on the verge of being somewhat terrified by things like Ebola. So everything old is new again. All right, so antibiotics, vaccinations, infections. What was the next great game changer in medicine? What was the discoveries that your predecessors who were interested in going into healthcare 100 years ago came up with that changed the game? What was the next big technological leap? Any guesses? So this is a picture in the Civil War and they're holding down a patient who needs to have their leg removed. Okay? And so it was anesthesia, the ability to operate at leisure. Because in the Civil War, you measured the competency of your surgeon by how fast they could saw. Because there wasn't much ether around. So pretty dramatic stuff. Okay? Anesthesia, the ability to operate at leisure, the ability for the surgeon who didn't know what was going on inside of you for she or he to operate on you and look inside and take a look and see what was going on. What was the next great game changer after anesthesia? Imaging. The ability to not have to have the surgeon open you up to take a look at what's going on inside. MRIs, CT scans, PET scanners, all these things so that now we can see without exploratory surgery, what's happening? Okay, so we've gone through the infectious, the anesthesia, the imaging, and I think we're now in the current great game changer of medicine. What is that? That's gonna change the way we practice medicine. That is changing the way we practice medicine. Any ideas? Molecular genetics, molecular medicine. If you don't believe that's dramatic, a young woman decides because she gets a simple tube of blood taken from her elbow, and they do the genomic study on it, just a, just a blood test, and they take a family history and find out that she has a significant history of breast cancer, and that she has a gene that codes for a high risk of breast cancer, a young, vibrant, healthy woman decides to have both her breasts removed in a prophylactic bilateral mastectomy. That's dramatic. That's significant. That's now you develop a cancer, and we take a sample from you, and we develop in the laboratory antibodies and immunotherapy to inject back into you that'll target your specific cancer to lessen having to give you the very dramatic and immunosuppressive medications that normally come along with all the side effects of cancer treatment. So we're in that phase. What's the next great phase? It's been touched on it. What's, when you enter the healthcare field, and no matter what role, what will have changed? It's going to be telemedicine. It's going to be virtual healthcare. It's going to be the ability to diagnose and treat in remote locations from your home to a ship at sea to a rural village in some third world country. This is just a picture of somebody, you can buy this attachment and you can put this on your iPhone. It costs about 80 bucks and you can put it on your chest and it'll give you an EKG tracing. So imagine that you're somewhere and you have some sort of chest pain or you're having dizziness or whatever and you call your doctor and your doctor says, well take your iPhone and stick it on your chest and I'll look right now and see what your heart rhythm's doing. We're going to get to the point now where we're going to be able to treat and diagnose from the corner drugstore, from a mobile van, from great distances. That's what's going to change. When I was at Bethesda, as the commander there, they came to me and they said, we need to use your conference room. I said, how come? And they said, well, the Comfort, which is a hospital ship, and we'll show you a little bit about that, but the, is down off the coast of South America. They're doing an OBGYN case on a lady there from South America. They're having problems. They've sort of lost their footing in the operating room on the hospital ship. And so we've got the telemedicine going, and we're going to televise that on your screen while some of our sub, super subspecialists in OBGYN come in and look on the screen while they're doing the operation and help them out. 
And so from Bethesda, Maryland, we are giving them advice and guidance over the screening of an operation that was going on off the coast of South America. This is going to be the new evolution of medicine in the world. This is where the puck is going to be. We have to skate towards it. All these things go together to creating a portfolio in military and Navy healthcare that ranges from medical centers to small community hospitals to clinics to hospital ships. And so what I found out as I spent time in, my, in this organization, my organization, is that we have such a large portfolio of things we do. So we have our research centers in Egypt and in Peru and in Singapore and in Vietnam and in Cambodia. And we partner with the army in Thailand and in Africa and we're invested in trying to treat some of the most egregious diseases and illnesses in the history of the world. What is the deadliest animal in the world? The deadliest animal in the world that kills more people than any other. Mosquitoes, strong work. The mosquito, a million people a year die from malaria. We're starting to see dengue in this country, chikungunya, all these exotic diseases which are now starting to infiltrate because of global travel and because of transient populations and the globalization of the world. And that's my backyard. I work for one of the most global healthcare organizations in the world. And yes, we're gonna deploy for Ebola because we can and because our support is needed to link arms with the governmental organizations and the non-governmental organizations to make a difference. And yes, I'm in robust talks with San, Diego, or San Francisco right now uh, as a credit to the civic leaders in San Francisco, they recognize, just as Napa, California did not long ago, if you have a tremendous earthquake, one that's ranging between six and seven on the Richter scale, and it brings down your infrastructure, and you can't travel into or out of the city because bridges collapse, airports become in disarray, your hospitals are impacted, as they were in Katrina, where Charity Hospital, the Tulane Teaching Hospital, the main tertiary care center of New Orleans, was underwater. What do you do? How do you take care of your citizenry until you can get the response from our country and others to start repairing that and building that up again? And a large part of that may well come from the sea as we sail up our large carriers to provide electricity and fresh water and housing and our hospital ships to assist with health care. What do you do if you are a country like Haiti, and I've shown this before, if you're a country like Haiti and all of a sudden you have an earthquake that crushes your people, crushes them. You're, you're not a country that's very solvent to begin with. You're sort of on a very frail economy. And now all of a sudden your country explodes and implodes and your healthcare structures are detonated, and there's nowhere to go for healthcare because the hospitals have come down. So I work for a company that makes house calls, and we made a big one there, as we did in Indonesia during the tsunami, as we do in the Philippines, as we did in Katrina. So our portfolio extends from research to healthcare and medical centers and cancer research and cancer oncology, pediatrics, neonatology, gerontology. We have a million beneficiaries. And so we have a whole range of people who sign up for us. Those that want to be out and about with the operating forces, they want to be forward deployed, they want to be at the scene of a battle or the scene of combat or the scene of trauma. There are others who want to be vested in research. There are others who want to be taking care of pediatrics. It's a ballet, it's an orchestra that all goes together to provide a deployable, ready force, a medi medically ready force, and a ready medical force. That's what we do. That was the surprise I found when I joined this organization and realized that it had probably the broadest portfolio of care across any healthcare organization in this country. There's just about something for everybody, and I embraced its diversity. I embrace the fact that we are a tapestry of individuals from all genders and all races and all religions and all backgrounds 
going into making a difference and giving back. I'll close with just a video of what happens if you are a country like Haiti and what we can help do about it. If we could show that video. I know I'm not going to be able to treat everybody for everything. I just knew I had to give everything I had to everybody who was on the ship. We're going to go to our neighbors uh, around the world and show them that we have compassion. We take care of people who have so little. You can put this ship off the coast anywhere, and it is a symbol of we're here to help. We're also here to learn as much from your country as you can from us. If you were to take John Hopkins or Walter Reed and put it inside the skin of a ship, that's what we have. We have digital x-ray, we have dental, we have optometry. We have a, a CAT scan machine. 12 operating rooms as well as an interventional radiology suite. We have our own um, oxygen plant that produces medical oxygen. 80 ICU beds and hundreds of ward beds. So anything you could do at a Navy or civilian hospital, we can do it here. The only difference is we can come to you instead of you having to come to us. Operation Continuing Promise is actually a regular deployment schedule where we take the USNS Comfort to Central and South America. The countries vary a little bit. We work with the Ministries of Health um, to be able to build a partnership of caring, a partnership of learning and education. We made a promise to these countries that we visited that in any time that they're going to have a need for us to come down and help them, uh, that we would be back. Um, I was driving home from work and as I was driving I started hearing about the earthquake and I told my wife I said well I'll get, a, get my uh, sea bag ready because I'm gonna be getting a phone call tomorrow we're gonna go down to Haiti probably by the end of the week I really felt that this is what I've been preparing my entire life for for Operation Unified Response the ship was underway in 76 hours on the way down to Haiti we kept receiving a lot of information via email about uh, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of people, primarily with orthopedic injuries. But it's one thing to see a couple of pictures on the internet, another thing to know that you're actually going to be a part of the human element of what we see, the devastation, the fact that that suffering was going to be coming on board in numbers that we had no idea of how many or for how long. When we're about 100 miles out, we started getting patients. Tough. We went, uh, <clears throat> we went nonstop the first three days. About every 90 seconds, those elevator doors open, and here come more and more patients, and they just kept coming. Then there would be about a 20 minute delay, the next round of helicopters, and there would be more and more coming. Anywhere from newborns that didn't have any family left up to, you know, senior citizens. So it was kind of like a mayhem because you've got two different cultures, you've got, you know, different types of understanding of the, of the disease process. So each and every patient that would come in, I would spend some time with an interpreter to understand their story because everyone seemed to be, the next one seemed to be worse than the previous one. You couldn't make this stuff up. We had an individual who was approximately 28 years old, and he had a very bad injury right over his elbow on his dominant arm. Basically, it took out the joint itself. Now, the interesting thing with him was this part worked just fine. So he knew that he was probably going to have to have an amputation. But in talking to him, he has a family. He has dreams for his kids. So I was with my colleague, a hand surgeon, Dr. Rulin, and we looked, and we saw that he may not have an elbow. But what about if we just connect the bones up? If we can get bones to heal, he won't have any motion across the elbow, or what was the elbow, but he'll still have the use of his hand. We took him back after the surgery into the recovery room. The first thing he did when he woke up is he kind of looked down to see if he had a hand. He saw his hand, he grabbed it just like he did before, picked it up, it works, it works. I think in the big picture, the big scheme of things, having the comfort and the mercy shows the rest of the world that we're not just out there to go, you know, drop bombs in the desert and, and fight wars. We can project a positive image and soft power on the rest of the country, rest of the world, and maybe change some people's opinions about us. We are military, but we're in a big white ship. 
As a matter of fact, many places we go, when they see us off the coast, they call us the great white angel from America. Every site, hundreds and hundreds of surgeries, lives that are changed, and impressions that are altered for the benefit of, of the United States of America and our partner and host nations as well. From a humanitarian assistance perspective, there's not anything more rewarding that you can do truly in the Navy. So as we speak right now, there's a Navy nurse in San Diego or in Bethesda or in uh, Virginia who is taking care of a patient who's in the terminal throes of cancer, alleviating pain, suffering. There may be in Okinawa or in Spain or in Italy at a, one of our hospitals where you're honored to be participating in the most precious moment of a family's life as we deliver a young child there to one of our families that live in that area in our labor decks and our OBGYN departments. Out in the South China Sea or in the Persian Gulf or off the coast of the Pacific or in the Atlantic, there's doctors and nurses and medical personnel who are tending to the, to the ship and tending to the people who are deployed. In Djibouti, Africa, in Monrovia, Liberia, we have our Navy medical personnel who are there linking arms and supporting and making a difference. We have people who are invested in research. We have people who are invested in the sequela of the hell of war. And you saw that Secretary of the VA talk about some of the new technologies that are coming out, but we're in partnership with places like Davis, Stanford, UCLA, Hopkins, Duke, Harvard. We had a young man who lost his arms, both arms, Sergeant Brendan Morocco, a couple of years ago in the war. And we just successfully partnered with Johns Hopkins to do a bilateral arm transplant. He now can shake your hand. He now can use a rowing machine. The technology is rocketing forward. Where are you going to take us? Where are you going to skate to? Where is the puck going? What difference will you make? I'm humbled by the passion that I see as I walk out among you and talk to you. I thank you in advance for the difference you're going to make. I thank you for recognizing that to the world, you may be just one person, but to one person, you can be their world. And certainly when the moms hit their knees in Haiti because their child was suffering, or a world away in Sierra Leone or Liberia, or on a battlefield of desperation, or in Africa, or in South America, or in San Diego, or in Davis, California. Sometimes people feel helpless, and sometimes feel, people feel hopeless. Thank you for being part of the equation that's going to bring hope and going to bring help. Thank you for your attention. We're around to answer some questions during the lunch hour if you have them. Thank you again.